be in sync with what what's happening around us uh if you remember when we first started this session our first talk actually was on covid or what is corona virus and stuff like that uh, uh and uh, just uh, a couple of days ago uh, the announcement was made for the nobel prize uh, in chemistry for this year and it was for this uh, technology called uh, crispr okay and uh, uh, the fact that it can uh, its application to what is called as gene editing or genome editing more correctly okay so i thought uh, maybe i'll read up a little bit and uh, and let you know as far as i am uh, my understanding goes uh, what this technology is so that uh, we all are little familiar uh, with this as uh, medicinal chemist uh, at some point even in drug metabolism maybe we might be able to use this technique uh, to create uh, very specific uh, mutants if you wish okay. so uh, i i am going to just uh, set it up like a little story uh, in terms of how it evolved and where is it uh, where it is uh, it is uh, right now okay so my first slide is, is uh, this which you call as the uh, you know the a classic uh, domain of life classification which talks about how things uh, evolve uh, and we have basically three large domains of life one which you call as a bacteria which uh, classically are also referred to as uh, prokaryotes uh, that is organisms without a, a nucleus and then the other main one which are called as a eukaryotes uh, which are all organisms which contain a nucleus and uh, somewhere in between are this uh, archaea as it is called uh, which is very interesting uh, they are uh, systems without a nucleus uh, so in that uh, sense they appear to be more like uh, prokaryotes or bacteria but if you look at some of the uh, endogenous uh, systems they have in place at least for replication etc uh, they that tends to resemble eukaryotes uh, and therefore it appears that this archaea are kind of like the go between between bacteria and eukaryotes and that's why they are kind of put somewhere in here okay uh, and uh, very interestingly initially almost all of the archaea or organisms uh, which uh, grow or live in extreme en environments so for example halophiles or thermophiles etc etc and people thought that because they are growing in this environment they are slightly different from everybody else but then when you look very closely they appear to have features of both bacteria as well as eukarya if you look at the number of bacteria that are there uh, as 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 far as we know uh, as of today about 200 genera are known uh, close to 11500 species are known and bacteria uh, uh, in this world come in different uh, shapes uh, for example uh, many of them are like rods for example this uh, listeria uh, so many of them are in spheres or what is called as cocci as we call it some of them are in spirals leptospira uh, and this is vibrio cholerae which is like a comma shape okay and they are present everywhere in fact uh, if you look at us uh, we are probably have more bacteria than our own cells okay in fact uh, close to 10 raised to 14 uh, uh, reside in our intestines only okay and uh, some of them are good some of them are pathogenic okay? and uh, but they are part and parcel of us in, in a sense and they multiply by cell division okay but uh, when we first learn about bacteria we learn that you know they simply multiply by fission to give you uh, two identical daughter cells but that is not always true there is an example how where one bacteria which is here which has got a little stem for attachment to a support Uh, is dividing but when it divides the second organism which is generated doesn't have a stem but it has a little flagella which allows this fellow or uh, the daughter to kind of move away from the parent go somewhere else settle down and then at that point uh, it will differentiate and uh, become you know have this stem like structure to attach and then when it divides it will also do the same thing okay. uh if you look at the genome of uh, these bacteria mm -hmm. Uh, uh, many of them uh, tend to have a single circular chromosome as their genetic material okay uh, uh, but there are exceptions to this rule for example vibrio cholerae or dinococcus uh, they tend to have two circular uh, chromosomes okay 
uh, pieces of DNA as, a, as their genome. Agrobacterium, if you remember your uh, uh, recombinant DNA technology, this is one of those organisms which causes uh, infection in plants, actually. Uh, Agrobacterium tumefaciens and Agrobacterium rhizogenes. That contains two chromosomes, one linear and one circular. And Borella, uh, a species, uh, a genus, uh, contains one linear chromosome. Okay. So uh, they come in all varieties. Uh, but in general, uh, most of the organisms, uh, which are bacteria, have single circular chromosome. Okay. And uh, here is a list, uh, a more uh, detailed list of you know uh, chromosomes and uh, the different bacteria. And this is what I was saying. Borrelia has got one linear chromosome. Agrobacterium tumefaciens has got one linear, one circular. Uh, Vibro, uh, Vibrio has got two circular, and so on and so forth. And in addition to this, they also might have in their cell other things which are called as plasmids, which are called as uh, extra chromosome uh, DNA, uh, and which uh, tend to give uh, properties to the bacteria, which helps them survive or give them a survival advantage, as they call it. Uh, even uh, those systems, for example, E. coli and many other bacteria, uh, even if you look carefully inside the cell, their DNA is just not a single circular piece, uh, which is simply double-stranded DNA. Okay. If you take uh, E. coli uh, DNA and just let it relax, you'll find that uh, it'll have a kind of a diameter of 350 micrometers. And this is way too big for the E. coli. So if you look uh, in the E. coli, you'll find the circular chromosome is kind of packed a little bit and it's packed and packed so that it can actually fit into that bacteria okay and this is done by what is called a super coiling which allows them the DNA to fold on itself and many times it might be assisted by other proteins uh, over which uh, uh, this uh, DNA might uh, actually fold itself okay like we have for human you know eukaryotes called as histone uh, they have histone like proteins okay uh, and, and, and that's how the DNA exists inside the cytoplasm uh, in a kind of a folded form. It's opened whenever there is a need for transcription and uh, uh, expression of the genetic information. Okay? Uh, relative to this, if you look at uh, eukaryotes, uh, our DNA is usually much bigger and uh, we tend to have many more chromosomes. Okay? Uh, and here are some examples. Uh, uh, if you if you look very carefully here, uh, we have uh, us which are here 46, uh, which is a diploid number. If you just simply divide by two, that'll give you the haploid number. In our case, the haploid number is 23, which is uh, 22 autosomes and one what is called a sex chromosome. It can be X or Y if it's haploid. Diploid, it could be XX or XY. And look where we are in relation to other cats have uh, 38, frogs have 26, uh, dogs more chromosomes than us. Look at this fern, 1,200 chromosomes. Okay, so uh, just remember we are uh, among all the eukaryotes. Just because we are humans, we don't have more chromosomes, or just because we are humans, we are we're not able to do everything with a single chromosome. Okay, we are just one among the many. And uh, if you look at uh, us also, you'll find in eukaryotes, because the DNA is big, uh, for example, if you take our DNA uh, and take all the chromosomes and lay them down end to end, it takes up, uh, the length is about two meters or so, okay? And we need to also package our DNA so that it sits inside the nucleus, and this is done using histone. So this is what is showing. Our DNA gets uh, coiled, super coiled, uh, and then it's wrapped around these histones, these histones are then very arranged very systematically to give you what are called as uh, nucleosomes. And they are also packaged into this loop structures. And finally, you get what we call as a chromosome with uh, you know, little things which we call as centromeres and all this. Okay? So there's a lot of compaction uh, which occurs so that our DNA uh, can uh, kind of fit uh, into the uh, nucleus which is present inside our uh, cell. Uh, if you look very closely at, uh, for example, human DNA, uh, which is now sequenced, you'll find that uh, as far as uh, protein coding exons are concerned, if you remember, uh, our genes are called exons and introns. Exons are the ones which have information regarding the protein which is supposed to be made. Introns, if you remember, are removed. 
when the mrna matures or is uh, is uh, what you call as modified because it's before it is finally translatable if you think very carefully if you look at the exon like sequences which are actually coding for protein there are only 1% of the genome introns are actually 22% of our genome okay the bulk of our dna if you look very carefully is a uh, unknown uh, defective viral sequences fragments defective transmosom fragments uh, some of which we like don't even know what it is for uh, here are some of the genes which code for rna these are pseudo genes which means they appear like genes but they are never expressed and so on and so forth okay i don't know what the sars is uh, i couldn't find the uh, full form but this is not uh, related to our sars okay uh, which is a virus okay uh, and if you look uh, uh, at our dna uh, we also have sequences which are very very interesting okay we have uh, some sequences which are called as unique sequences which appear in our dna only once uh, but uh, if you look very closely at our human uh, dna we have lot of repetitive dna it actually makes up close to 50% of our dna that means 50% of dna is made up of sequences which have got if you look very carefully inside those sequences uh, have repeat sequences and there are three types of repeats uh, what we call as uh, 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 moderately repetitive highly repetitive and less repetitive okay and there is also in addition to that what we call unique sequences okay so this three main types of sequences actually should be four non repetitive less repetitive moderately repetitive and highly repetitive okay and uh, w- w- what does this mean okay uh, let me look at the repetitive dna if you look at dna which is repetitive there is again uh, uh, mainly two types highly repetitive and uh, what do you call as intermediate repetitions if you look very closely we have got things which are called as tandem repeats tandem repeats means repeats occurring one after the other then we have interspersed repeats that means repeats occurring with little gaps in between okay and then all these things have little terminologies associated with them for example uh, short interspersed elements long interspersed elements what you call as mini satellites micro satellites uh, variable number of tandem repeats short tandem repeats okay multiple copy genes and satellite dna and so on and so forth okay and uh, again here is another way of looking at our dna uh, what is interesting is look at this these are a protein coding genes only 1.5% look at this interspersed repeats interspersed elements uh, unique sequences again which are uh, there uh, other things we don't know the functions of these are introns see how many of the sequences never get expressed okay so very interesting uh, uh, architecture of our uh, uh, dna now if you look at the repeats a little more closely we get a different types of repeats okay one of them is called as direct repeats so what are direct repeats so if you look at the sequence for example uh, i'm looking at only one strand the other strand is complementary if you remember the dna disparity rules uh, every time there's a t there will be an a if there's a there's a t and if there's a g there is a c and if there's a c there is a g on the other strand so if you look at the sequence at the top it goes T T A G C A C, and right next to it is followed by the same sequence T T A G C A C. So this type of arrangement, where the sequences are right next to each other, are called as one direct repeats, and this is an example of a tandem repeat. Okay. Then we have what are called as uh, mirror repeats. So I'll come to this in the last. Mirror repeats are very interesting. If you look at the sequence, we have again T T A G C A C. but then right next to it it's as if i put a mirror here it will go in the reverse so see c a c g a t t so it's like looking at myself in the mirror so c c a a c c and so on and so forth such type of sequences are called as uh, mirror repeats then we have what is called as repeats which have a dyad symmetry or what you call as palindromic repeats these are very interesting so if you look at this sequence here on this strand it goes t t a g c a c then g t g c t a a if i come to the other strand it will read the same so see this t t t t a a g g c c a a c c then g t and so on and so forth so when i read 
from 5 prime to 3 prime on this strand the sequence that i have is exactly the same when i read 5 prime to 3 prime in the same region but on the opposite strand okay such type of sequences which have what is called as dyad symmetry or called as inverted repeats or what is called as palindromic sequences okay so this is not like a classic palindrome which is seen in english see in english when we write a palindrome uh, uh, for example uh, something like uh, eve okay so it's like i write eve and then i read it backwards it again becomes eve or something like madam okay m a d a m or something like uh, sandhya would say malayalam okay uh, it reads in the in the same in the other way so what that would imply is a palindromic sequence would be something like this see this so i go t t a g and then i come back also to c t a g c a c okay but in dna terminology this is called a mirror repeat and the word palindrome is there for this and the reason for this is see when i look at this i'm reading in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction but when i come back i'm reading in the 3 prime to 5 prime okay and that is why i cannot say the sequence in one direction is the same as the sequence when i read it in reverse okay so when i read it in reverse i should be in the same formal direction which is 5 prime to 3 prime and that's why maybe this type of sequences are referred to as palindromes in dna language okay so these type of uh, uh, sequences are seen in dna uh, for example there is a stretch of dna and you see this ag ac okay and keeps on repeating ag ac ag ac and so on and so forth and you can see that so such type of repeats are called as short repeats and when they appear right next to each other they are called as tandem repeats okay and they are present again and again in the uh, in the dna Uh, here is an example of a mirror repeat okay but look at the variations in the mirror repeat this is a classic mirror repeat so if you look very carefully i got a g a a a c c and i go the other way i got a g a a a c c but then i can have a mirror repeat which has got a single spacer in between so if i ignore this g c then this is a mirror and this is also a mirror sometimes i can have a double spacer in between two and then again i have a mirror again have a mirror repeat or sometimes i can have a big gap in between but then on the other side of that gap are mirror repeats okay then these type of repeats can occur right next to each other they are called as tandem repeats okay and tandem are of two types with gaps and without gaps without gaps are called as continuous di mirror repeats and so on sometimes mirror repeats can overlap okay so these are also very tricky sometimes you don't spot them because as one sequence ends the other mirror repeat begins okay so all these type of sequences occur in our dna and so also we can have palindromic sequences so these are see palindromic sequences i have shown one strand only but uh, concentrate on this region here which is shown in yellow so see ta tc tc okay and then there is ga ga ta now if i would look at the other strand no here would be ta t c t c so t a t c t c as i read there and then if i keep going here the c would be g a g a t a g a g a t a so so this is also a palindromic sequence and this also repeats with little gaps in between but since this is not a classic palindrome this also has a little sequence in between where there is a, where there is a little gap in the palindromic sequence what happens is when you look at the dna it can take this type of shape so see this tt it then goes t a t c t c and then there is this stretch see this t c t t c t t t c t t c t t and then again you are back to the palindromic sequence and the beautiful thing is palindromic sequences are such that they can form these type of what is called as hairpin loops and the sequences are beautifully designed so they are complementary so say this g is complemented to c a is complemented to t then g is complemented to c so i get these things and then i get these structures which are called as hairpin loops so if i look at the stretch of dna on one strand i'll see this hairpin loop then there's a little sequence where there is nothing then again there's a palindrome i get a hairpin loop and so on and so forth now if i look at the other strand which is complemented that will also have a hairpin loop here okay and that type of structure is called as cruciform structure okay so these things uh, are seen in uh, our dna uh, different types of repeat uh, sequences and so on and so forth
okay but whatever be the case the way the dna is set up we all know that there are certain sequences in our dna which carry a lot of information and that information is read uh, and that gene and this there should be a e here that gene is converted to a message which is in the rna language which we call as mrna which by the process of transcription and then this mrna is read uh, three codons uh, 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 okay uh, uh, three codons at a time three bases making up a codon i should say three bases making up a codon and each codon is read one at a time to assemble the proteins which will finally make up the uh, uh, the functional protein okay and this information flow is we call as a central dogma of of life okay now in bacteria uh, very interestingly what you find is many a times that lot of genes which are needed at the same time and for the same process are found one after the other on the gene okay so for example this is an example of a lac operon where there are a lot of genes arranged right next to each other which are involved in what is called as uh, uh, lactose metabolism okay so what they will do is they will take lactose they'll break it down to glucose and uh, galactose and then they are able to take that further and convert it into uh, intermediates which can be then used on your glycolysis uh, pathway okay now the way these uh, uh, operons are set up is very interesting okay now look at this example here when there is no lactose present uh, okay that is the media doesn't contain any lactose then a pro uh, a repressor okay uh, that repressor sits on this dna and when it sits on the dna it doesn't around the rna to actually read this message and make uh, uh, rna sorry rna polymerase to read this gene to give you the messenger rna which codes for lac z or lac y or lac k okay which means that because there is no lactose and I, i have no need for these proteins i have created a system where in the absence of lactose this gene will never be transcribed to give me rna and if there is no rna made i will not make protein and thereby prevent wastage of making proteins when they are not needed but see what happens when lactose is present a little bit of lactose gets metabolized to what is called as allolactose okay and this allolactose is able to again bind in this region to this repressor and when allolactose is present the repressor falls off the dna and then this rna polymerase can actually read this sequence make the rna and from there you can get all the proteins which are needed to metabolize lactose Okay, now this was discovered way back in 1961, and when the, it was discovered in 1961, uh, if uh, if you were to read that paper very carefully, uh, what you would find is that the person who wrote this paper, Jacob and Monard, uh, proposed that this repressor was a product of the regulatory gene. Okay, and uh, and when you read carefully, they never said that this product or this repressor is a protein. They, they they initially thought it is probably rna okay somehow that uh, rna is involved in controlling the expression later on when people studied this lac operon in detail they found that actually this repressor is a protein and not rna and then other repressors were also identified and now we know that this is a very common phenomenon the having proteins which bind to dna which do not allow transcription to occur or which allow transcription to occur faster okay what you call as repressors or activators as they are called but the original idea of jacob and monod okay was actually that the repressor is not really a protein but some product of a regulatory gene and kind of indirectly they implied it was a piece of rn okay uh, uh, many years later okay uh, when people were investigating you know uh, molecular biology or cell biology they actually found what uh, jacob and monod had proved okay uh, for example if we know that if this is a region of uh, dna and i want to make a protein by reading the sequence here what i typically will do is read the sequence get what is called as pre mrna and uh, in eukaryotic systems if you remember pre mrna is uh, uh, modified by removal of uh, introns adding a 5 prime cap poly a tail and so on and so forth to give you mature rna and then once i get my mature rna it comes out of the nucleus goes into the cytoplasm and then it is 
uh, acted upon by all of my ribosomes at the translational machinery, and I get my uh, protein finally. Okay. Now people found that one way to regulate the production of these proteins in our bodies was that there was a system where the same sequence, okay, that is the same region, okay, shown here actually together, but actually I should have shown it in the same color coding as this. What actually happens is, for example, if this RNA is produced by reading, say, this strand, in this schema, what happens is what you get as a product RNA is obtained by reading this strand. So when you obtain an RNA by reading this strand, what you end up getting is a piece of RNA which is exactly complementary to this. Okay, and in our body, what happens is this RNA is actually processed by what is called as this dicer systems to give you small pieces of RNA which are called as micro RNA. And the beautiful thing is this micro RNA has got a sequence which is exactly complementary to this mRNA. Okay, and why is it complementary? Because it was produced from reading the exact opposite strand. And then this mRNA comes and sits with this on this RNA, and you get what is called as RNA interference or RNA silencing. Okay. And in fact, this dicer and all were discovered in the 2000s uh, as a mechanism for actually regulation, the expression regulating the expression of genes. In fact, late after that, this dicer uh, has been used to silence a lot of RNAs uh, uh, in the in, in a cell and look at the consequences of what is called as stopping the uh, production of certain protein. Okay. So in that sense, what Monod said or Jacob said was actually approved uh, later as what you call as miRNA or microRNA or silencing RNA or the phenomena of what is called as uh, RNA interference. Okay. Now going further, if you again uh, look at uh, uh, DNA, uh, somewhere in 1987, uh, Yoshizumi Ishino from Japan, uh, while investigating E. coli and a certain region of the E. coli, which codes for what is called as alkaline phosphatase, found that in the E. coli genome or E. coli uh, DNA, there was a certain set of sequences which was uniquely arranged. Okay, so if you look very closely uh, in E. coli in that uh, specific region where Ishino was looking you found that there were certain sequences which were repeated, shown here in pink. So see this, pink, 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 and pink. And they were about 21 to 40 base pairs. And in between those repeated sequences were sequences which were non-identical, shown here as gray or say green or blue, okay? but they were about 20 to 58 base pairs and smack in between these repeated sequences okay and they were called as what is called as spacer sequences so so so, so remember one thing repeat sequences are identical to each other and are in a sense conserved but these spacer sequences other than having this length are very different from each other but they appear in between these repeated sequences okay so to, to show you an example of uh, how this repeat unit uh, looks. Uh, look at the sequence here. So if you look very carefully, within the sequence, I've just expanded a region here, which is say TGC, see this C, TGC, and the opposite strand would be GAC. But if you look at the sequences which are flanking that TGC, see this C, G, C, 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 T, A. So C, G, C, 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 and T, and there was an A here. But look at the other side, it is uh, GC, GGG, GC, GGG, again another G and A, and the complementary stand to that. And if you look very carefully at that, if you realize that this is a palindromic sequence with a little gap in between. So, so, so if I set it up here, see this T, A, T, T, A, T, and then the palindromic sequence begins, C, 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 C which is again palindromic to GGGG, which is here, okay? And then it goes GC, and then at this TGC, which is there in the middle here, and then again it comes back, and it can base pair to give you this hairpin loop, okay? So such sequences were found in E. coli, and uh, they didn't know what it was, okay? The only thing was, it was creating problems in sequencing, because when you have these repeated sequences appearing again and again, 
when you actually try to sequence DNA, it creates a lot of errors because you don't know how many repeats are there because the sequence appears to be the same when you do what is called as uh, sequencing. And that is uh, uh, shown here. So initially when they were doing the studies, they found like four or five repeats. But then when they did the work again, they found that the repeats were not four, but there were about 14 to 15 of them. So if you, if you look at the sequence of uh, DNA, uh, here is uh, a, a stop codon. This is a stop codon of this enzyme, alkaline phosphatase. And then right following the stop codon were these repeats. Okay, so what is shown here in red is all those uh, palindromic repeats which I talked to, and in between there are these spaces. Okay, and that region is shown here in this expanded form, and that is given a name what is called as CRISPR. We'll come to that a little later, but for now, realize there is this alkaline phosphatase, there is a stop codon, then there is a repeated sequence here, and then after that repeated sequences, there are another sequences which are referred to as CAS sequences. Okay, CAS standing actually for CRISPR associated sequences. Okay, because they always are associated with this type of arrangement of palindromic repeats in between which there are spaces which have got their own different sequences. Okay, and something similar to this. Uh, okay, and before I go to that, this is how it appears when you do gene uh, sequencing of the DNA. So wherever those sequences are repeated, you see that your DNA readouts will appear almost identical. Okay, see this? You see this blue, black, black, red. Blue, black, black, red. So blue is for C, black, black is for G, T is for T. Then again, there are two Ts. Then there is this error. I don't know what exactly it is. Then there is T. Then C, 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 C. Same. You see the same pattern appearing again and again, telling you that there are this repeated sequences and the same thing was also observed in a, a archaea okay and this is a, a, a one which goes in uh, salt water halophorax mediterranean and there again they found the same thing repeat sequences which were kind of palindromic okay see this uh, sequence here g here then i've got at at then again there's a mismatch then again there is palindrome g g g C, 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 A, A, T, T. And I can again form a little hairpin loop. Okay. And this was discovered in around 1993. Okay. So, so now they were trying to figure out, okay, you know, why is this type of sequence appearing in bacteria? And now I'm seeing it in archaea also. And uh, uh, this is uh, looking at both put together. Okay. So what we found in E. coli in 87 and later what we found in uh, Halifax, Mediter Halifax Mediterranean in 1993. Again, same architecture, repeated palindromes and spacers, which have got sequences which are different, uh, but they are different from each other and uh, and also in between uh, intraspecies differences. Okay. So at that time, people started calling them different names, short, regularly spaced repeats, spacers, interspaced, direct repeats or large cluster of tandem repeats and so on and so forth different terminologies were used to describe these findings okay and they always found that they were located in a intergenic region that means in between genes and they always contain multiple short direct repeats of the same sequence and these repeats are interspaced with sequences that appear to be random okay what we call a spacer sequences and there's always a common leader sequence, 1200 base pairs on one side or the other. These are what you call as a cache type of sequences, which are there on both sides, sometimes on the right side, sometimes on the left side. Okay. Now, very interesting. They found it in bacteria, they found it in archaea, but they couldn't find it in eukaryotes. Okay, so not really sure what they were doing, what they were. Okay. Then something very interesting happened. Okay, around 2000. When again, you know, somebody was looking at this and finding out what it was, they found something very interesting. Okay, all these parts, which is the non palindromic part, so it is in gray or green or here, you know, kind of uh, olive green, I don't know what to call it, or this is olive green, this is blue. They found this sequence is very interesting. They seem to have similarity to bacteriophages and some viruses which were known to infect those organisms. Okay, 
and this was found out by this gentleman called uh, Mojica, okay, uh, from Spain, and also Purcell. Uh, I think uh, he was also from France, I think, okay. So both of them found that these sequences, which are non-palindromic, which are not what do you call as classic repeats, were different from each other, but they always had resemblance to some sequences which they found in bacteriophages. Okay, and they were the ones who actually coined this term, which are now called CRISPR, and they call it clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Okay, so clustered means found together, short, regularly interspaced. Okay, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. So they were talking about this pink as the focal point of their definition, which we call it short palindromic repeats. Okay, and the short form for that was CRISPR, as if there is an E in between, uh, but there is no E in between. It's CRISPR. Okay, uh, Mohika and Ruud Janssen actually came up with this terminology. Okay, and uh, just to, uh, 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 interestingly, there's a nice picture of E. coli, which is being attacked by phages, okay? Uh, so sometimes, you know, some things are very beautiful. We think E. coli is more small, who will attack it? But there are phages which are smaller than E. coli, which can attack E. coli. And uh, E. coli has to do something about these phages, right? Uh, because it can't get killed every time the phage comes in. So also other bacteria. So they also have a little different system. Okay, so let us see what they do. Okay, now uh, the other thing that they observed was the repeated cluster has in its vicinity other genes which are called as CRISPR associated genes, what we call as CAS genes. Okay, now as I, as I said, the spacer sequences were found to have been derived from phage DNA or plasmid DNA, and it appears that the sequence were gathered by this bacteria when they were infected by viruses or when viruses are trying to attack the bacterium in which we found these CRISPR sequences. Okay, And that's when they first suggested the potential role in adaptive immunity in bacteria. But when this paper was submitted, uh, they were initially rejected by many reputed journals. And finally, they got uh, published. Okay, Because this idea was so radical that bacteria can have what is called as adaptive immunity uh, something which uh, nobody had uh, even thought of at that point. Okay, we didn't think bacteria could have immune systems like you know we had. Okay, or humans had or eukaryotes had. Okay. Now going further, at that time, uh, you know, remember DNA sequencing started to get more and more easier to do, and whole genomes were sequenced of several organisms, and they found that in many organisms this CRISPR type arrangement was observed and they always found that there were these, uh, you know, what you call as regularly clustered or regularly interspaced uh, short palindromic repeats. And right next to that were genes which were designated as CRISPR associated genes. And typically there used to be four different types where one and two at that time uh, had, uh, people didn't know what the role was or there were no relation to the known genes. While three and four genes bore some resemblance to helicases and exonucleases. So initially, when they discovered this, they thought that somehow these CRISPRs were involved in uh, DNA repair or DNA metabolism, recombination repair, chromosome segregation. The direct role in immunity was not thought of. Okay, uh, That came a little later. Okay, And then an interesting experiment was done. Okay, uh, Because of this idea that it is probably related to immunity. Now, in this organism called Streptococcus thermophilus, if you were to look at some of the CRISPR sequences, okay, and which sequences, spacer sequences, they had some identity to the phage sequences, okay. Now, uh, what they did by RDNA technology was actually derivatively inserted in between this palindromic repeats a sequence of a phage which was known to infect Streptococcus thermophilus. Okay. Now, once they did this experiment, now this thermophilus has in its genome sequences which are resembling this phage. Now, when this bacteria was infected by that phage, that phage could never infect this bacteria, and this bacteria was actually resistant to infection by this bacteria. Now, this is the interesting part. When that sequence which was inserted in Streptococcus thermophilus 
was removed from the phage DNA or the phage genome, then it was able to infect Streptococcus thermophilus. So it, it appears somehow that this sequence which was present as part of CRISPR, if it is always also present in the phage, then the bacteria was able to do something to the phage DNA and therefore the bacteriophage could not infect the bacteria. But then if the virus didn't contain that sequence, then it escaped the system and it was able to do the infection. Okay, somehow kind of correlating this idea of adaptive immunity. And then this was a proposal. Okay, the proposal was that when viruses or phages or foreign DNA enter the bacteria, what happens is inside the bacterium as part of this, <coughs> what is called a defense system, endonucleases which are present inside the bacteria and which includes actually this Cas proteins, break down this DNA to short pieces. And these pieces are all different. And what is done is these pieces are in inserted into this CRISPR region. And where are they inserted? They're inserted in such a way that they become a spacer in between palindromic repeats, okay? So now, actually what has happened is in the bacterial genome, because of this infection, there's a change in the genome where the genome now contains a short piece of DNA, which is of the virus. Now later on, what happens is, when the virus tries to infect again, at that time, the same genome, which is present now in the bacteria, is transcribed. And when it is transcribed, because of this presence of this palindromic repeats, you get this type of structure. See, remember this uh, hairpin loops? But in between them, if you look very carefully, are these sequences. And these sequences are what? These are sequences which are actually originally derived from that virus or that piece of DNA which infected, right? So when I cut this and process it to give me what is called as CRISPR RNA, I'll find that this sequence here will be complemented to one of the two strands, right? And because it's complemented to one of the two strands, it can go and kind of bind in that region where from where it was derived from. Now, when it, that happens, there's this other protein which is called as Cas9, what is called as CRISPR associated uh, genome sequence, ka, uh, gene sequence ka protein, which has got an ability to cut this double stranded DNA. So now what happens is, based on this recognition sequence, which directs the CRNA to the pathogenic DNA. Now that pathogen DNA is broken down and is cut, and basically the DNA is destroyed. And now because this DNA is destroyed, this phage cannot now do any damage to the bacteria, okay? Now the, the beautiful part is, if another virus attacks, another piece of DNA is taken and it is put here. So you keep on adapting in a sense to newer infections and newer viruses which the bacterium encounters. And that's why it is called as adaptive immunity, okay? So uh, again, uh, uh, a little more in detail, I have a virus which comes in. There are a lot of these sequences which are part of this uh, CRISPR array. And what happens is virus ka sequence get inserted in there. Okay. And when they get inserted in there, what will happen now? I've got this green sequence, yellow sequence, blue sequence, red sequence, which are all part of viral DNA or what is called as foreign DNA. And these whites are all these palindromic repeats. Now later what will happen? I can read this to give you my mRNA. And my mRNA will have this sequence which is different than this palindromic sequence, this sequence which is different than palindromic sequence. And when I cut all of them, I'll generate all these different CRISPR RNAs, all having different affinities, again, somehow related to the DNA which was originally encountered by the bacterium. One of them might be able to then bind to the very specific DNA of the infecting organism. And then with Cas, the DNA will be destroyed and you will get what is called as a protection against the virus. Okay. Now the beauty about this system is that it's very similar to our system. The difference is what? We encounter a foreign organism, we break it down to small pieces, we take that protein and we express, uh, present it to our antibody producing cells, we produce antibodies and then we have what is called as memory cells so we are able to both destroy the antigen and keep a memory for later infection. Something very similar is happening here, except they are not producing antibodies, but they are producing what is called as CRISPR RNA. There also we have encountered 
we have done expression then we have destruction we have memory but the beautiful thing about bacteria is after that their genome has been modified when that bacterium divides the daughter cells also get the same rna uh, modified and therefore in that case that immunity is inheritable which is not the case with humans or in eukaryotes okay so in a sense it appears that bacteria are having a adaptive immunity which is slightly better even uh, than our uh, our system which that we have okay and uh, now uh, they got to know what is the function of cas1 and cas2 so what cas1 and cas2 do they are involved in breaking the foreign dna which has infected the bacterium and inserting it as a new spacer region in the crispr arrays okay so now things started making sense why these things are all together what is this uh, you know Uh, palindromic sequence. What is the spacer which is different, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then here is a now cycle as you understand. Virus comes in. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> These cas proteins help break the DNA, then insert the DNA as part of the CRISPR array. Later on, this CRISPR arrays are read to give you this. Uh, what is called as crispr rnas and this crispr rnas are able to uh, target complementary uh, sequences on the organism which is invading and then able to break that dna and prevent the organism from causing an infection okay so as of today uh, when you look at these crispr sequences and crispr associated genes uh, it appears that close to 80% of the rkr which have been analyzed okay 202 out of 232 you see this crispr okay it is also present in almost 50% of all the bacteria that has been looked at close to like 3060 out of around 6700 okay and the number of crispers in one genome can vary from 1 to 18 that means what the same bacterium in its genome might have got at one location to up to 18 different locations each of them having this uh, you know uh, palindromic repeats and spacers okay and the number of repeats in a crispr unit itself in a single crispr you can have two palindromic with one spacer in between to up to 374 palindromic repeats with spacers in between okay and the beautiful thing is it's not that it is present everywhere for example mycobacterium tuberculosis has this crispr mycobacterium leprae doesn't seem to have it. so people are still trying to figure out why some bacteria have it some why some don't have it why sometimes there is less than less in number why there is more why sometimes there is less repeats why there are more repeats we are still on trying to understand all the features of what this crispr are doing in this organisms okay now if you start looking even further at the different types of uh, crispers and the cas proteins you find There are basically two classes of CRISPR. What you call as class one and class two. In class one, what you find is uh, there are different types of Cas proteins which are associated with the expression or adaptation and uh, uh, interference. Okay, so I should actually you should do read this in this way. Uh, for adaptation in type one, you need these three Cas products. Then all these are in this interference part where it is transcribed and cut and all. And this is in the final expression okay now if you look at all of them the simplest among them is actually type 2 if you look at type 2 cas1 and cas2 are involved in adaptation but if you look at this interference part there is only one protein which is called as cas9 okay and that is the reason why if you look at the present uh, technology they tend to use this class 2 because it's much more simpler it has got less components okay in fact because these two are only there in the organism to cut and put the dna in the part of the crispr in the actual cutting part of the function where i get uh, you know uh, i detect a foreign dna and uh, and i uh, interact with it and cut it there only these two are required and what you need is a piece of rna which will direct this cas to cut it correctly okay and this is the one which is used as part of the technology uh nowadays it's called as uh, crispr cas9 technology okay now again this is a classification of all the different types of crispr 
so what what i want to do is uh, class 2 is found mainly in bacteria class 1 is found mainly in archaea archaea tend to have very little or no class 2 in bacteria both are present but class 2 is present to a significant larger amount than in archaea okay so to put it uh, very briefly class 1 uses several cas proteins and crispr rna class 2 uses a single large component cas9 protein in conjunction with what is called as crispr rna and what is called as tracer rna okay and uh, this is where uh, our nobel prize winners kind of come in okay uh, uh, if you remember the nobel prize was associated uh, 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 was given to two ladies and one of them was actually looking at uh, 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 this aspect of so if you look at the uh, components of crispr as we Uh, you know use it okay there are three things you have to remember one thing which is called as proto spacer adjacent motif i'll tell you what that is in a little while uh, pam uh, second is what you call as uh, uh, crispr rna that is the rna which is going to uh, detect the dna which is going to be cut and then there is what is called as trans activating crispr rna or tracer rna again its job is to help in uh, locating the dna and uh, cutting okay now uh, let me get to this okay so when uh, one of the two nobel laureates was uh, investigating uh, streptomyces pyogen okay what uh, she observed was that uh, for this crispr cas system to work in destroying the invading organism Uh, when this crispr region is being read to generate what is called as crispr rna two pieces of rna were generated okay so one piece of rna was actually generated from this spacer sequences okay which are again if you remember unique sequences uh, interspaced with what is called as palindromic sequences okay but as that was being produced somewhere near that cluster in another region there was another uh, uh, rna which was produced which had some parts which are actually complementary to what was being produced here to a, to the point that this rna and this rna were able to actually base pair and base pair and collectively then they would interact with cas9 and cut the dna okay so uh, this was what is called as a transacting uh, dna Uh, rna and this was called what is called as a crispr rna okay so two pieces of rna were actually required in order for uh, that system to target a dna which is complementary to one of these sequences this is the sequence which is going to detect that complementary dna uh, that is how it will get targeted and then that cas will come in or cas9 protein will come in which has got nuclease activity and will cut the dn okay now the the beautiful thing was uh, the nobel prize winners did something very interesting okay they understood the system a little bit better and what they did is rather than requirement for two different pieces of rna to be you know added to the system so that cas can cut the dna what they did is they made one single piece of rna knowing what the sequences are okay so what they did was they joined together the two pieces of rna to give you what is called a single guide rna so the single guide rna is actually a combination of crispr and trans activating what they did is it made this use of system much easier so now what all i had to do is make a single guide rna which is this and i know that the single guide rna has got features which will allow cas to come and it also has features which will allow it to bind to the dna that i wish and allow the cas to cut the dna okay and they realize okay because of this unique uh, uh, property of what is happening if they were to change this piece here okay that means i keep on changing this sequence here if i keep on changing this sequence here i can target different dna and very selectively go to that dna and cut it so i can get what is called as very directed editing of the genome of the organism based on the sequence and typically the sequence which is picked here is close to 20 base pair long and such a long sequence of 20 base pairs uh, you will not get too many 
uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call as uh, non-specific interactions along the genome, because the probability of a certain sequence occurring by chance, if it's a 20 p sequence, is 1 by 4 into 1 by 4 into 1 by 4 into 1 by 4, 20 times, which is 1 in several billion. Okay, so uh, the, the, the idea was, okay, if I pick a long enough piece, which is so unique, that it will recognize only one piece of DNA in the entire genome, then I can go very specifically to that region of the genome with this system of this guide RNA and CAS and cut that. And basically, when I cut that, that piece of DNA will be now destroyed or the DNA in that region will be destroyed. Okay. Normally, what happens is, uh, this is again shown here. I have this uh, Cas9 in the inactive state. Then I have this guide RNA, which has got features which will allow you to bind to the DNA, which is supposed to be cutting. And they all come together. And then when the other DNA to be cut comes by, then this thing comes and sits there. And see what happens. See that PAM? PAM, remember that? The terminology? Protospacer adjacent motif. Okay. Now that is important because what happens is when the system comes and sits here, and this is a target, and where it cuts is actually near this PAM sequence, around three bases away. Okay, that is where the cut occurs. Okay, now, if this PAM sequence is not present, then this will not cut the DNA. Okay, so this requirement of this PAM sequence to be present in the non-target strand and the target strand and a complementary being sequence being present in the guide sequence is also very, very important. Okay. Otherwise, what will happen? That these interactions will occur, but if the sequence is not there, it will not cut it. Okay. And that is where the kicker was. Okay. That uh, uh, this requirement of the sequence. So, which means that when I design this 20 base pair, remember I told you that I can put any piece that I want. When I des design this 20, I have to make sure that this 20 piece. Right next to it, there's a PAM sequence. If there is no PAM sequence right next to it, then the system will not cut it. Okay. So that is the, the, the understanding of how this thing uh, works. Okay. So see what? Here is my, uh, uh, you know, CRISPR RNA, uh, tracer DNA. I put it and make it into one. Cas comes in. These things all sit together and they cut. And where do they cut? Right near what is this PAM donor. Okay. Now, the beauty of uh, the, the two Nobel Prize, as I told you, was to design one single piece of RNA, which has got this complementary sequence for targeting and the guide sequence, what you call as the single guide RNA. Okay, And uh, these are all the things which are present in CAS. CAS has got what is called as REC1 site and RUV site and HNH site and REC2 site, PAM interacting site. And all these things are all very important for its functioning of interacting with, uh, as I say, it has to interact with CAS, uh, I, no, it has to interact with uh, foreign DNA, it has to interact with guide RNA, and then cut the DNA, foreign DNA. Okay? Now, this is how people use this technology. What they do is if I want to do a very specific genome editing, they first did, uh, did select a genomic target. And then they pick a 20 base pair sequence, which is very unique to that genomic target, which is not found anywhere else. And make sure that it is followed by this spam sequence, which is NGG. N could be any nucleotide and GG. Okay. And now uh, I have to also make sure that the sequence or something similar doesn't appear anywhere else in the genome. I can do that by what is called as online searching. Then I, based on this, I designed the single guide RNA. What is the single guide RNA? That has this 20 base pair sequence, okay, and it also has that remaining sequence which is needed for interacting with CAS, okay. So all of them are put together in a vector to give you what is called as the guide RNA backbone, and then that is used for cutting the DNA at a place where you want to cut. Okay. Now, what happens after you cut? Okay. After you cut the DNA at a certain site, in the organism, two things can happen. Okay, After the cut is made, sometimes the organism will repair that cut. And repair that cut 
not knowing what to do because it's a blunt cut it will put random pieces of bases here when you put random bases of bases here that sequence will now be very different from the original sequence and i'll get a mutation and that might silence that entire gene or what i can actually do is after that cut is done i can actually supply a piece of dna such that a repair will be done the way i want it so that i can get what is called a site directed mutagenesis and i can actually correct that genome if there are any defects in that genome by putting a sequence that i wish okay so uh, and that is the idea okay so now if you look very carefully uh, the technology has moved further now we have got what are called as crispr variants okay what are crispr variants uh, crispr variants are uh, for example ones which can do what is called as nics single nics okay if i do a nic uh, rather than cut that entire piece of dna what i can do is let us say i have a gc sequence i use this crispr to make a single cut after i make a cut i attach this uh, deaminase to this cas9 the deaminase will convert the cytosine to uracil and then i uh, you know repair the nic and i make the dna intact now what will happen when this dna gets replicated this g will be translated to c but this u will be translated to a and after a while i'll get the uh, what do you call it at base pair instead of gc base pair in that region or as i said i can cut the dna and i can do directed repair or sometimes i can do what is called as rt directed what is called as dna repair where i use a reverse transcriptase what that will do it will take the original dna which is cut here and then instead of Uh, it will take this uh, 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 DNA and using an RNA template that is present in the guide RNA, make a appropriate DNA and allow you to do a mutation at the place that you wish to do. Okay. So it is for this that these uh, two ladies got the Nobel Prize. Okay. Now remember that these type of sequences are present was detected by Ishino that they. are also found in arkea was done by uh, you know another group then that do sequences somehow are related to adaptive immunity was done by another group but these two people actually identified that system and made it simple enough for you to do editing and that ground breaking paper uh, which showed this was this which was published in science in 2012 a programmable dual rna guided remember at that time Uh, there was cr rna crispr rna and what is called as uh, tracer uh, tracking rna okay both which are needed to to do what is called as uh, cutting as part of adaptive bacterial immunity this is uh, jinek who is the first author who was a postdoc in the lab of uh, uh, jennifer durn okay this is emmanuel charpentier from france actually they were both working on different things but they met somewhere in a conference they decided to work together and they came up with this okay now this is the first time the nobel prize has been awarded to two women at the same time otherwise it has always been uh, uh, one woman one male and so on and so forth but uh, never two women together okay so this is a, a kind of the first uh, in, in in that sense but as i say every technology comes with ups and downs so there are issues with uh, crispr one is uh, how to target very specific tissues and cells okay and making sure that uh, in case you are doing say in vivo editing of a genome it doesn't go to a tissue which you don't want okay how will you deliver cas9 and guide rna to a cell okay uh, till now they have been doing it by micro injection electroporation uh, but nowadays people are trying other ways of delivery like nanoparticular delivery and so on and so forth the other thing is this need for this pam sequence if the pam sequence is not there cutting will not occur that puts a little restriction into where you can do editing and how you can do editing and then when you give this uh, to a live organism we have our own immune system and these are all proteins and we might uh, actually trigger uh, immune act activity against this cas9 when we are given and again off target effects okay even though we try to be very specific there's always a potential or what is called as off target okay now this is what i have told you different ways of delivering people have uh, tried to deliver it by you know uh, 
uh, nano particular delivery or micro particular delivery or or through vectors different type of vectors and so on and so forth okay and uh, this is what i told you even though we use a 20 base pair sequence which has got very little chance of of target effects see this was designed against this piece here okay vg vascular endothelial growth factor uh, site and uh, even though this was designed as a 20 base pair look at all these places where potentially those things can also interact so these are called as off target where the sequences are similar enough that you can potentially have effects at those places okay so this is can be disastrous okay this can create a lot of problem when you're trying to use this for very directed editing okay uh, now we also have got uh, these crispers which are called as crispers from privatella and francis cella another uh, bacteria uh, they also belong to class 2 uh, but uh, they are slightly different they do not require tracer rna at all they require only one that uh, crispr rna and uh, the best thing is uh, they cut uh, at a sequence uh, near the pam region but it is not a blunt cut which is a staggered cut sometimes that is an advantage when you do what is called a genome editing okay and uh, again their requirement of pam is a little more flexible rather than very specific which was seen for the original crispr 9 okay uh, and uh, that's what this is what like. it makes a staggered cut so you see the cut is done like this rather than a blunt cut okay and that's an advantage okay and now there are more such variants each with different different properties and you can look it up at uh, at a leisure okay but like just like everything no uh, there are controversies but now you can and uh, there are a lot of sgrna designing tools which are available on the web where if you want if you know the genome sequence or gene sequence will tell you how to design the guide RNA. Okay, but uh, see the controversy. There were two other people who also played a role in uh, this technology. One was this gentleman called uh, Virginius uh, Sikins, who is a Lithuanian, and uh, and see what happens. He was also working on the same technology, and uh, he submitted uh, their study uh, uh, to Cell, and Cell rejected the paper without a review. Only. Okay. And frustrated, he again submitted it, and then it got accepted by PNAS, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. But this delay was where, in between, Doudna and Charpentier published in Science, this CRISPR technology. And suddenly, they got all the fame and name, and this fellow's paper, which came a little after, kind of was, you know, nobody even looks at it now. Okay, but... People who are in this area realize okay, he had also submitted much before them into cell, and he should have also got credit for this discovery. Likewise, if you look at many of the uh, awards Charpentier and Doudna obtained initially, many of those awards were shared by this gentleman called Feng Zhang, who is uh, from MIT. He's only 38 years old, but he was the first to take this. CRISPR genome editing technology and do editing in eukaryotic systems. Okay, and in that regard, uh, he worked in close collaboration with Charpentier and Doudna initially. But later on, because you know, see what happens: fame, science, you know, this potential for Nobel Prize and all these things, they change things. Now, Charpentier and Doudna also don't see eye to eye. Both have their own companies; they have gone their own ways. They only came together to receive the Nobel Prize. Likewise, Charpentier and uh, Feng Zhang and Doudna are also in a patent fight, okay? For who should get the patent for this uh, gene editing technology and so on and so forth, okay? So in a sense, uh, the background is a little murky. So even though Doudna and Charpentier have got their Nobel Prizes, there are a lot of people who don't feel uh, good about it because they feel they should also be given recognition as part of this thing. And in Nobel Prize, you can give prizes to three people so a lot of people thought that the third would have been should have been given to Feng Zhang at least. Okay, but uh, for some reason he has been ignored. Okay, so uh, I am going to kind of stop there. Uh, but uh, as of today, uh, doing this gene editing in the human journal and cells has been banned because of this gentleman who was in China. And there's an interesting story 
uh, he worked in uh, the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, People's Republic of China, and he ran a fertility clinic. Okay, and one of the things he was doing was help people uh, or couples where the father was HIV positive and mother was HIV negative to uh, be able to uh, you know have a child. Okay. So at one point, when he heard of this technology, he offered fertility treatment along with CRISPR to alter the CCR5 gene, which is present in humans. And when you alter this gene, HIV cannot infect you. Okay, so it's a, a an alteration in CCR5 gene makes you automatically resistant to infection of HIV. So what he thought is because uh, father is HIV positive and mother is HIV negative. Uh, to make sure that the kid will never get HIV, one, I'll offer fertility. At the same time, I'll create a baby which is HIV resistant. The problem was this was done in secret and in violation of many of the clinical research norms. And when uh, this technology was done, uh, twins were born called as Lulu and Nana. Okay, we really don't know the real names, but these are the names which are given in the media in October 18. And then the couple also had a third child in 2019. Now, all these kids, because of this technology, have got their DNA now modified. Okay, we really don't know uh, exactly what has happened to those children in terms of their alteration in their uh, genome. But because of this uh, uh, technology, uh, which was done violating many of the norms of clinical, as of today, this gentleman is in prison. And then all the people who are in this CRISPR technology business have got together and said, okay, we will not use this for human, I shouldn't say gene editing, germline cell editing. Okay, so that's where we stand, a technology which is good, but which can potentially be very, very harmful. Okay, so thank you. And uh, hopefully you got a feel for what this uh, CRISPR technology is. Okay, so uh, I'll stop sharing. Let me see if I can get back to the main screen. So if you have any questions, uh, please do ask. So the prize actually went not for the discovery of those sequences, but for actually making those uh, uh, that system adaptable for easily editing uh, genomes. Okay, and that's where Charpentier and Dudna came in. Okay, uh, they made it uh, such that you can use it very very easily in the laboratory. Okay, any questions? I don't see anything in the chat box either. Hi, sir. Hi, hi. Uh, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that the number of CRISPR sequences is around 1 to 18, it can be. <laughs> so I uh, wanted to know these, uh, so in those 1 to 18, the spacer sequences can be from different phages? Yeah, yeah, different phages, different phages. So I've got 18 such sets, mm -hmm. and depending on what my encounter has been, mm -hmm. uh, those sequences can be different. And also the sequences change during the lifetime of the bacterium. OK? OK. Uh, because so I said it can be used for uh, different others. Uh, yeah, yeah, different phage infections or different okay. plasmid infects, uh, invasions. And it evolves. Yeah. OK. Uh, as it encounters more. A different uh, DNA and bacteria, it will evolve. And uh, uh, when it divides, also it passes this on to the offspring. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. And uh, and though eukaryotes don't have these kind of CRISPR sequences, mm -hmm. but when they're attacked by virus or phages, they do they also retain or insert the virus sequence into the genome? No, no, we don't. We don't. Don't. What we okay. do is we break it. And what we do, we don't deal with the DNA, at least as, as far as we know till today. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do is we don't do anything to the foreign genetic material of the invading organism. But mm -hmm. we take the protein, break them down, and present mm -hmm. them as epitopes or antigens to make antibodies. OK, OK. So no, because we, by mentioning the genome, you said some person, I don't recollect, about viral sequences. So. Ah. See, those have been uh, inserted by viruses themselves because okay. we get infected by viruses which are of the 
type which can integrate their genome with ours. For example, many of the retroviruses and the HTLV T cell or what you call as uh, adeno associated viruses. So they are constantly putting their uh, DNA in our genome. Okay. And sometimes <laughs> if this happens at the germinal level, we, uh, we, we, that becomes part of us now. Mm -hmm. okay. But that is not part of a system wherein you take that DNA and put it in our, uh, our DNA. Okay. I don't it's just the this. proteins that we process as antigen. Yeah, we tend to process the protein parts and present that as different epitopes, just like they present different pieces of DNA as different epitopes. Okay. And uh, what is the role, exact role of these plasmids? I notice not all the bacteria have these plasmids, right? See, plasmids tend to give some advantage to the bacteria. Okay, for example, uh, let us say there's a plasmid which produces P450. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, if you remember uh, P450 CAM, no, mm. uh, which is produced by Pseudomonas cutida, which carries a plasmid, and this P450 can then oxidize camphor. And uh -huh. this oxidized camphor metabolites uh, on further oxidation can give you products which are used by the bacterium as a source of carbon. Okay. Uh -huh. So essentially, the bacteria can now start to grow on camphor rather than glucose. So that advantage is given by this plasmid. Okay. So, okay. so long as there is camphor in the media, the organism will keep the plasmid. Once uh, regular glucose comes, it keeps only one or two copies. It never expresses it. Uh -huh. uh, and then it, that plasmid just sits there. Uh, there are other yeah. plasmids which tend to produce, uh, say, antibiotics. So that kills <laughs> off the competition. Okay. Okay. Then there are fertility plasmids which allow conjugation to occur and so on and so forth. So they always tend to give some advantage, but they are uh -huh. not required if conditions are optimal. So so they, the bacteria tends to live happily if everything uh -huh. is okay. But these plasmids help overcome situations where uh, it is unable to have a uh, you know a, a very nice uh, environment to live in, so that sometimes gives some survival advantage. Okay. And that's why in RDNA technology, you know, if you remember, when you make uh, uh, put foreign uh, DNA, you always take a plasmid which has got some antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. what you do is after you make the recombinant plasmid and you put it back into the bacteria, you have to keep giving that antibiotic. So that the bacteria keeps on needing that plasmid, mm -hmm. which produces an antibiotic, but also produces your gene ka product. If you okay. remove the antibiotic, it will lose the plasmid. Okay. And uh, though uh, it cannot be used for germline and uh, this editing uh, mm -hmm. this, but for disease gene editing and all, it's used. Yeah, yeah. They, they have said that you can do research on other things. Just don't touch the germline. So don't try to modify humans. That is the Okay, okay. Uh, that the arrangement uh, that uh, uh, because one of the things that it, uh, it could be potentially used or I should say potentially misused is to make uh, designer babies. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, where what I do is uh, I silence certain genes which are bad uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the you know the fetus uh, and therefore those harmful things will occur, never occur to that organ. So, okay. so that is uh, so that is what a moratorium is on. So you can still work on genes, uh, other autosomes, but uh, don't do anything at the germline level. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so I hope uh, that now when somebody tells you that the Nobel Prize was awarded for CRISPR technology, uh, you are a little familiar with what this technology actually is. Okay. Uh, not too bad. So some of those kids uh, who gave a poster on that day were not able to attend. I see only Neha, who was the organizer. Uh, 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 tell her that uh, some of these things will appear on the channel and they can always look it up a little later. Okay. But again, remember, uh, I have just read about this technology and gathered as much as I could. Uh, to present it to you. Okay, I have not worked with this technology. So there's a lot of this uh, technical aspects to probably CRISPR technology, which would be better presented by somebody who does this. Okay, So maybe down the road, we should get somebody who's in that area uh, and was used CRISPR to give a talk to us so that we know a little bit more insight into actually uh, some of the things which may have, we may miss because we don't uh, get a feel for it. Okay.
Okay. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, should I stop presenting? Okay. Chalo. Take care.